Oh hi, I'm the heretic. On the question of how a stateless voluntary society would defend itself, one remark that's given far more often than I'd prefer is how a stateless voluntary society will defend itself against aliens. And before you ask, this isn't anything related to immigration. I'm talking about honest to goodness, Martian, E.T. the extraterrestrial, close encounter of the third kind extraterrestrial space aliens from outer space. More specifically, a civilization composed of sapient life forms that have evolved on a planet outside of Earth. They have bridged the gap between stars and are now making contact with our stateless, voluntary society. What do we do? The argument goes that in regards to an alien civilization, the best case scenario is to have a peaceful government initiating contact. If they are hostile, such as in War of the Worlds or Independence Day, aliens who have come here to murder our faces, a government has the military capability to fight back. Even if it is ultimately futile against a civilization with technology vastly superior to ours, our probability of survival is greater, with the state leading the charge. With a peaceful alien civilization like Star Trek, a government has legions of diplomats ready to initiate peaceful contact and negotiate mutually beneficial terms of coexistence. A decentralized fighting force, it's argued, is going to be picked apart piecemeal by hostile aliens, while friendly aliens will need to negotiate with thousands, even millions, of little atomized companies and or communities rather than negotiating with a few dozen states or globalist institutions like the UN or EU. While improbable in the extreme, in this scenario, we can identify the superiority of a state to other institutions in dealing with this problem. We'll tackle this claim later. For right now, we need to establish some facts about our aliens, what they are, where they came from, and how they got into space. For the purposes of this discussion, we're not looking at questions like the Fermi Paradox or any of its great filters that would enable intelligence to arise. For more information on that, the YouTuber Isaac Arthur has done amazing work on the Fermi Paradox, exploring these topics and more in greater detail. But for now, we're going to assume that there is not only alien life, but life to make up an interstellar civilization. Firstly, we must assume these alien sapiens exist in the same universe we do, which means their biology follows the same principles, the same laws of physics as ours. They evolved on a planet which orbited a star inside of the Goldilocks zone, or the place where water can be liquid on that planet. As these scientific principles are in place, we can extrapolate that other scientific and objective realities also apply. For example, such an alien civilization would have to understand the principles of mathematics, since they would need that knowledge for more practical fields like architecture or engineering. Because they would understand mathematics, they would also have to understand a priori reasoning. Such things are universal, no pun intended as despite having evolved on another planet entirely, they are still subject to the rules governing our shared reality. From this, we can extrapolate that they are also subject to the laws of economics. Firstly, that resources are finite on their world, and that alien economy will have to figure out the most efficient means of distributing those finite resources, which would certainly be a system of prices governed by supply and demand in a free market economy. We know that all creatures evolve with survival and reproduction in mind. A jellyfish's purpose in life is to create more jellyfish, the same with chameleons or armadillos. The overwhelming success of sapience on Earth is due to high intelligence being selected for in the gene pool long ago. Regardless, the success of sapience is dependent on its ability to reproduce. The purpose of our brains is to create more brains. In order to do that, living things need resources, such as food. For beings with higher intelligence capable of abstract thought and refining resources into more useful form, our resource needs are going to be more complex. Now how this sapient alien species acquires these resources is going to be a matter of debate. But what we do know 
is that they will need capital equipment, economic specialization, and free exchange. There is no telling what socio-political struggles or ideologies they'll develop in order to reach this conclusion. It may be that their species evolved to be more atomistic compared to humans who are social and tribal animals. They may even be eusocial, evolving with or into a complex, hive-like social structure. They may even evolve into an entirely unknown social structure, the conditions favoring its evolution not having ever existed on Earth. But regardless, the only logical conclusion they can reach is that free, voluntary exchange between consenting moral agents is the best mechanism to achieve mutual prosperity. Perhaps most importantly, such a civilization shouldn't have a state. In fact, I would argue that statelessness should be one of the Fermi Paradox's filters. Let me explain. In order to send information through space, it is still limited by the speed of light. We can send radio waves to Proxima Centauri, but as the star is 4.2 light years away from the sun, it will take 4 years and a few months before the message can be received and another 4 years and a few months before a reply would be given. This is even further exaggerated the further out you go. Imagine being delinquent on your taxes, so the IRS sends a warning to you. It takes 200 years for the message to get to you. Now, imagine you're a good boy, who also happens to live longer than 200 years. So you reply, yes IRS, here is my tax money. It will still take 400 years for the IRS to receive your money from the time of their initial sending. It gets even better if you tell the IRS to go frag themselves, and in response, they send police to arrest you. The time between them receiving your reply and the police arriving at your doorstep is going to be another 200 years. So from the point of them initially sending their warning to you to the time the police arrive at your door is going to be a grand total of six centuries just trying to arrest you for tax evasion. There is no government system that can sustain itself with such an enormous time lag between notification of non-compliance and enforcement. It is not sustainable. The way this is avoided in fiction is that there is some form of faster-than-light communication system. The trouble is that in reality, the energy requirements for sending even photons faster than light are incredibly cost prohibitive, requiring entire galaxies worth of energy to send even short, simple messages. No theoretical models of FTL communications that I am aware of can circumvent this problem. More importantly, in order for people to be able to live off the grid, or at least outside of state domination, all they would have to do is send a self-sufficient, or even self-replicating space colony out into the void. After all, maintaining a coercive monopoly is a lot harder when literally anyone can get the capital to grab their own spaceship and fly out to God knows where. From there, asteroid mining, space-borne hydroponics, and the construction of Dyson spheres can all be done without ever having to comply with any state regulations or taxation. And such space steaders would outcompete the state economically. Space steading, like homesteading or seasteading, would become the increasingly viable alternative to government control over their lives. And because of the gigantic time delay between learning of delinquency and the response of force, no state could possibly exist in this way. And thus, they have a direct incentive to suppress space travel, or if there must be space travel, to monopolize it into the hands of the state. This is not conjecture. These are economic realities, which are always going to be true no matter what planet or what environment on the planet. And no, we can't hand wave this by assuming some form of faster than light space travel or communications could exist. We live in the real world, so unless some model of faster-than-light travel can be formulated, which isn't incredibly cost-prohibitive in terms of the energy demands, we cannot rationally include it as a factor in our hypothesis. If you are writing a story where FTL travel does exist, by all means, 
figure this stuff out for yourselves, and I look forward to seeing what creative ideas on how superliminal travel affects statism. So why would aliens visit us? They certainly would not be hostile for a number of reasons. Firstly, what do they hope to gain from invading a planet full of warmongering monkeys with nukes? They have already expended a vast amount of energy to simply get to the solar system, so they must be seeking some form of profit from this. Do they want resources? Which resources? What does the Earth have that cannot also be found in greater abundance in the solar system? Iron? The asteroid 16 Psyche is believed to contain 10 quintillion dollars worth of iron, or 10,000 quadrillion, or 10 million trillion. In addition to not having their mining operations disrupted by disgruntled natives, or having trouble getting it out from the large gravity well of Earth. Do they need gold? Again, asteroids. Same goes with just about any mineral or metal you can think of, which, if they have the technology to travel to our solar system, they almost certainly have the technology to synthesize any elements they need, making mining pointless. They wouldn't need heavy metals, since nuclear fusion provides more energy, and hydrogen is the most abundant element in the universe. They could just scoop it out of the sun if they're so inclined, or from Jupiter's atmosphere. Do they want fossil fuels? Again, it's a less efficient power source compared to fusion, but nevertheless, Saturn's moon Titan has literal oceans of hydrocarbons. They almost certainly wouldn't want to come to Earth for its energy resources, since such a civilization could just build a Dyson Sphere around the Sun and never have to deal with our crap. Just to be clear, when I say Dyson Sphere, I don't mean actually enclosing the Sun in a solid shell. I mean a network of satellites with solar panels that capture 100% or near 100% of the star's light into useful energy. We, theoretically, have the power to do this today, just build mines and factories on Mercury and use it to build individual Dyson Swarm satellites which beam the energy back to the factory to power the production of future satellites, allowing for exponential growth. But anyways, back to the aliens. Do they want water? The comets in our solar system, the icy rings of some of the gas giants, and Jupiter's moon Europa should provide all the water they could ever need and any civilization that can mine Europa for its ice has the technology to melt ice. Just saying. Do they want Earth for real estate? The ships they're piloting to get to the Earth are proof that they can just make more land. There's no reason that they can't strip mine the planets Mercury or Mars apart and build space habitats from them. Hell, the space habitats can be satellites in the Dyson Swarm. Maybe they need slaves. Aliens are here to subjugate us. Firstly, we already know that slavery is inefficient and has a chilling effect on innovation, so to attempt to fill their labor markets with slaves makes no sense in the long run. Slavery is only sustainable through the state, and since statism is unsustainable in the space age, any alien civilization that would be trying it would be the last vestiges of a crumbling government. Besides, surely a spacefaring civilization would have the technology to automate whatever menial jobs they would need slaves for in the first place. So since natural resources are more abundant elsewhere in the solar system or can easily be acquired within their own civilization, there is no reason for aliens to greet us with hostility. So are they ignoring us? Are they following a prime directive? Is that the reason we haven't encountered aliens yet? is because they don't want to interfere with the development of our civilization? The idea of the Prime Directive comes from Star Trek, where the Enterprise and other ships on the Federation are not allowed to interfere with primitive civilizations. If this is true, then the aliens should be nominated for being the biggest douchebags in the universe. Imagine you're on the USS Enterprise and you would come across this alien civilization. From what you can tell, their civilization is primitive and operates on a caste system where there are three levels in society, simply referred to as the workers, the vassals, and the rulers. The rulers wield absolute power but bestow a fraction of it to the vassals, 
giving them advantages, which leads to them giving untold wealth in exchange for their loyalty to the ruler caste. The workers are, since birth, indoctrinated into a cult that worships the rulers as exalted higher beings capable of solving all of society's ills. The workers are then given the ability to choose which individual members of the ruling caste gets to rule them every few years. Although now and again, members of the vassal or even worker classes get to become rulers, this never results in any lasting change or improvement in the living standards of the workers who are still required, through threat of force, to donate a certain percentage of their working years to the rulers, while the remaining percentage is given to the vassals. At least the vassals offer some goods and services in exchange for that remaining percentage. Naturally, your heart should break seeing the plight of these enslaved alien people subjugated as they are, but the Prime Directive prevents you from interfering. You are reminded that they should figure it out among themselves, but you know that your inaction is going to prolong their suffering. Perhaps to better illustrate how ridiculous the Prime Directive is, imagine if you had the cure for cancer. It's very easy to make, in fact, and the recipe is simple and can be easily, endlessly replicated. But right now, you are its sole possessor. The Prime Directive would require you to hold on to it until society figures out this cure for themselves. Even if your inaction does prolong needless suffering for millions of people. If someone from the Enterprise were to go rogue to enlighten this primitive species, or if some thief were to copy your recipe for distribution, would it be justified to stop them? Is it even ethical to stop the spread of ideas that will help people? Of course not. Now, of course, this doesn't mean the Enterprise, or you, Mr. Cancer Cure Holder, are obligated to help. You aren't required to do anything from an ethical standpoint. All I am saying is that the active stance to oppose helping people cannot be justified. But the aliens are here. They're poking around in their little spaceship, and otherwise making themselves known. So who are they? Why are they here? They're anarchists, and they're here to trade. That's it. They might want some piece of technology that they might not have developed, but we have, or even just want resources we've already extracted and refined, rather than go through the trouble of setting up mines on an asteroid. Whatever the reason, they want to initiate a mutually beneficial exchange. With this in mind, the question of how a stateless voluntary society should respond to a technologically superior race that wants to trade is moot. Society as a whole does not need to intervene in the transactions between two consenting moral agents, nor does any third party that claims to speak on behalf of society called a government. And we know they won't come all this way just to wipe out humanity. Who are we going to defend ourselves against? The galactic milkman? I don't think so. They would have reason to want to trade with us as well. Since we evolved differently, biologically, there will be certain traits selected for on Earth that will make us more competent at producing some things, whereas the aliens will be better at producing some other things. It's just economic specialization, and trade will benefit both of us. Even if they are superior in every way to us, naturally, that doesn't mean jobs won't be available that the aliens might be unable or simply unwilling to do. After all, there is no static amount of labor that would create the Malthusian catastrophe of perpetual unemployment. If only Cuck Tuck the Cuck knew that. Anyways, my point is that although the concern is reasonable, since, after all, we fear the unknown, the alarmism that statists try to inspire in regards to contact with an alien civilization has no basis in reality, since alien civilizations, if they do indeed exist, wouldn't be here to wipe us out. But what's it really all about? When statists ask about aliens, it's a metaphor for a larger, more powerful state coming in to invade. The answer is the same in regards to the military question, which I answered about a year ago. A decentralized military structure is going to be vastly more effective than any government military, as they have the advantage in technology and its troops 
are not weighed down by political concerns or objectives. If a stateless, voluntary society would be utterly unable to fend off an opposing hostile force, then it would surely put up a much greater fight than if the people had put their trust in the hands of a coercive monopoly. The only organization with anything to fear from an extraterrestrial civilization is the state itself. No civilization can expand outside of its gravity well with a state. Expansion, in this case, defined as the presence of self-sufficient extraplanetary colonies. If they made contact, they would have learned from us a long time ago from intercepting the innumerable radio transmissions we broadcast constantly from Earth. From there, they would learn about our history, our culture, and most importantly, our captivity to a coercive monopoly. If they showed even the slightest inkling of compassion, or simply wanted a more prosperous primitive civilization to trade with, probably both, they would help us remove the state from our societies, teaching us how they overthrew their states and offer suggestions for how we might replicate their success. The state would suppress knowledge and contact with extraterrestrials for this very reason. However, any civilization with the ability to travel at light speed or faster wouldn't be deterred by at real Donald Trump blocking them on Twitter. Don't get me wrong, I like alien invasion stories and the space opera genre as much as the next guy. I don't mean to ruin anyone's enjoyment of science fiction by pointing out the trouble in assuming that a spacefaring civilization would need to be parasited by a coercive monopoly. But I will close this discussion admitting that this point is moot, and the aliens question is just another form of whataboutism for statists to avoid having to confront the fact that the state's existence cannot be justified. The what about aliens is as much using the special pleading fallacy as is the question of the military, roads, and courts. People aren't wrong in being curious about these questions, but to reject the justification of a voluntary stateless society on the grounds that it's not clear how the roads will be paved is to reject logic and reason entirely. But if you're confronted with the aliens question, at least you'll be prepared for how to answer. Questions? Comments? Critique? Do you believe intelligent life exists? Why do you think we haven't detected them yet? I personally think they're too far away to be detectable via their radio transmissions yet. Leave a comment below. Support me on Patreon. Like, share, and subscribe to become a heretic today.